Take the Warriors way. We got a special guest today, the mad scientist of boxing, a.k.a. Coach Mark. Um, he has the lab. He's out in Philly producing champions on a daily. He's done work with terrific fighters. Uh, Lil Futures, one of his. I believe his yeah. own, Flesh and Blood. And That's he's right. also worked with uh, B-Hop. I've seen him do some incredible work with, with uh, Bernard Hopkins, um, other Philly legends around. And so he's, he's just a man that knows boxing. And I just thought he'd be a great guest to share with you listeners out there. So welcome, Coach Mark, a.k.a. the mad scientist of boxing. Um, I appreciate you having me, man. This this is an honor for me. It's allowing me to use another platform to discuss whatever it is you want to discuss. Um, so I need to give you your flowers for that, for giving us people, no matter what we do in the, in the world of boxing or the sport of boxing, we need a platform. You know, there's a lot of great coaches. Uh, people want to use the term trainers, teachers out there, and they just don't have a platform to be able to express or get certain messages through so this is great for me so i appreciate it hey thank you thank you coach mark before we get into i really want to get back into the roots of, of the beginning of your boxing journey because i think there's so much that that fighters can learn from other people who've been there done that and traveled this road a little longer than them um mm -hmm. before we get into that you mentioned coach trainer teacher okay so growing up I had an old school trainer, an old black man named Bill Sangster. And at one point in my life, I actually lived with him. And he taught me, he said, look, he said, I'm your trainer. He said, I teach you the sweet science. He said, them guys out in Colorado Springs, USA coach, he said, them, them are coaches. He said, when you get there, they're getting a ready-made fighter. He said, you already, he said, I trained you, I taught you. And so he always frowned upon, he would never want you to call him coach. I know right now he's probably turning over in his grave hearing coach come out of my mouth. Cause he said, no, no, don't ever call me coach. He said, I'm a trainer, a teacher of the sweet science. And so growing up, I always looked at it like that. And later I fought for the army for Bashir Abdullah, who I called coach. He was an army coach, Olympic, four time Olympic coach. But he, Coach Abdullah taught me different way to look at it. And I just want to get your take on it. But he said that there's a coach, there's a trainer and a teacher. And he said the coach can spot talent. He got a good eye for talent and he knows how to give instructions in the corner. And those are like your Team USA guys. A lot of them are real good in the corner strategy wise. He said mm -hmm. the trainer, that's the guy in the gym. He's conditioning you. He's training you. You know, and then he said in teaching, he said a lot of times teaching happens maybe on the road when you're with your fighters and you might be teaching them about, about life. You might be teaching them about boxing. You know, you were getting caught with that right hand. Why were we getting caught? He said, but it happens in a less intense environment. And so he kind of broke that down. And since he did, I kind of eased up my my old school philosophy of being a trainer versus a coach and kind of brought it all together and like said, okay, well, there's room for all of it because there's a need for trainers, right. coach, and teachers. And Bashir said there's very few that actually have all the attributes to, you know, combined um, to, to do it all. So what's your take on the semantics, the word itself, the words, and, and the meanings behind the words, trainer, coach, and teacher? I, I think you just said it all. It's almost like I really don't have to answer it, but if I did, I think it's all necessary, it's all relative. Um, coach, yeah, I think coach, even saying the word now, I think when you think of the term, the word coach, that's just the title. I mean, you're you're not a parent of that kid. Maybe if you, you raised the kid up or taught a kid from the beginning and you were introduced by his parents or by his guardians or something, that's what they would refer, you, refer to you as like, this is your this is going to be your coach or this is coach such and such. So I think that's just a normal title that you give anybody that's running a particular thing, wrestling, basketball, boxing, football, whatever, is they'll be coaching you. And I think to kind of elaborate a little bit more, coaches like they supposed to bring the best out of you. Kind of like encouragement. That, that, 
Yeah, that's that's exactly what I think a coach is. They're there to you know to kind of motivate you, to push you, to bring whatever it is that, that you have to offer as an athlete out. You know, they're just supposed to bring the best out. So you're right. You send a kid, you send a kid that you or an adult teenager, whatever that you work with for so long and you groomed them up and you trained them up and you send them to USA boxing or you send them to the nationals and football or basketball, they already know and have all, everything that you, you done fully armed them with everything. So they're again, they're going now that coach just have to bring everything that you taught them and train them for out. So, right, I, I can agree that that's what a coach is. A teacher, now I love this part, as far as the teacher, um, I, I'm, I'm still uncomfortable with me being called a, a teacher, but I like, it, I like the direction I'm heading in because I think what a teacher does is, you mentioned something about, you're not only teaching them about that specific sport, like if it's boxing or whatever, you're not just teaching them that. That's what, a lot of people don't know when I use the term the lab, they don't really know what the LAB stands for. And I want to kind of brand it more. So again, I'm glad I got your platform. The lab stands for me. LAB is life and boxing. Mm, mm. Man, I love that. I love that. So, I mean, come on. Like, um, I, I haven't really pushed it out there, but I'm getting my circle of people. Of course, Bernard Hopkins, you mentioned the great yeah. living legend. Hopkins, I got great people in my corner that's willing to support. They kind of just waiting for me to to really put, you know, really, really go hard with it. But yes, that that I, I have to put that life first because I don't care yeah. about making a national champion. I don't care about making a world champion. It, it's it's all great, but if these people don't have their life in order, if they don't have respect, you got it. Uh, you know, just you know, that, that character thing. So life comes first. And everybody that walks Man. through my door to come to my property, come in my garage and train. I, listen, I done gave them the third degree. I got guys still, guys and females both still sitting in my phone and my DMs waiting for me to give them the okay. But I'm kind of digging into their life, like into their lifestyle by looking at their Instagrams, yeah. they, anything I could find on them before I give them the okay to come because I need to see how you living. And not to say if you living wrong, I won't help out. But it, you know, I, I listen, life comes first, man. Yeah. So I build those values in my kids. Future mm -hmm. is my big mention, little future. So the, you know, that's what I would feel that a teacher provides in boxing yeah. since we uh, really talking about that is everything, life skills, boxing skills. And then the trainer, as yeah. you stated it, just from the grassroots, you taught that person everything they know. You provided and and put in the them into yeah. So yeah. that's and boxing what and life. And you know, with the life and boxing, man, we're so connected, man. I I actually have a program. I do online coaching, and it okay. boxing's the vehicle. Boxing's what attracts people to come work with me. Cause they want to uh, improve. They want to win a title. They, you know, national championship or something. And I'm a real technical, you know, I'm a technician when it comes to technique. Uh -huh. um, I look for flaws. I look for holes in your defense, you know, and I teach uh -huh. superior strategy. I teach, you know, competitive greatness, how to be at your best when your best is needed and mental toughness as part of training. And that program is called the warrior's way. And I've been doing it as a hundred, a hundred day program. And it's, mm -hmm. and in my, in my, you know, information about the program, it actually says, you know, life, you know, to become a champion in boxing and life. That's what the words say. They say to become a champion in boxing and life. And at the beginning of that, it says to conquer your doubts, fears, and uncertainties and transform them into courage, confidence, and belief to become a champion in boxing and life. And there's so many fighters. I mean, we think of the greats who, who been to the top, who made millions of dollars and end up broke, but it's cause no one educated them. No one taught them. They didn't know yep. any better. And now this young, young person from the hood, you know, they first time they had any type of money in their hands and they, they could ruin their lives with that. 
you know, Thanks. where where if they were taught and schooled and like, look, look, young man, you're not going to you're going to spend more time being a retired fighter than you are a fighter. This is a short mm -hmm. I mean, even a 20 year career, which, you know, I had 18 years in the ring. That's still a short time compared to the rest of the time you spend out of the ring. And the key thing is to maintain your faculties. I know Floyd Mayweather preaches this and, and teaches this. Smart fighters like Bernard Hopkins, you know, the art and science of hitting and not getting hit. You know, we can't just be taking punishment and we got to preserve the body. But we're in such alignment on that, um, Coach. I, I just appreciate and respect your with everything you're saying. But I want to get into your journey. And I want to go back to day one when you were introduced to the sweet science to begin with. How did that happen and where did you go in your own career and, you know, and then evolving into coaching and training fighters yourself? Well, I, I must say, um, in all honesty, first and foremost, I wasn't I wasn't never really a, 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 a that that guy you know um as far as boxing is concerned but to to start and just bring you through a little bit um from day one i've you know i've heard stories of my dad who had me him and my mom had me at a young age at i believe like 17 17 18 somewhere in there my dad went off to the military over in japan he was in the marine corps so uh they said from the first day I was kind of like in, in my great grandfather's uh, winter coat. Like I'm, I'm a little baby and he had me in his winter coat while my dad was getting on the airplane at the airport, sending him off. So my great grandfather from the very beginning was involved in boxing. And as I grew, I guess four or five years old, when you can start actually remembering how things look and remember certain things. So I can remember listening to boxing on the radio. You know, not, not even TV yet. It was kind of like 78, 79, 80, just listening to, and Henry Armstrong has him on the ropes and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, maybe at that time, I, well, I don't know who Henry Armstrong is at that time, but 81 was the year I was seven years old. 81 was the year, and the fight was such a mainstream fight, but it was on wide world of sports on ABC. Saturday you, afternoon, yep. It was Tommy Hearns and Sugar Ray Leonard. Oh, now the first the first fight. The first fight. And Hearns got him in that first one. Yeah, I mean, well, Sugar Ray stopped him in the 14th round, but Hearns No, 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 on boxing. the first, yeah, on the first one, Hearns, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Ray Leonard yeah. got him. Yeah, that's the one when Leonard got the torn retina, but Hearns was out boxing him. I mean, clearly was beating him on the cards through the, it was a 15 round fight and he was right. beating him on the card, but Sugar Ray was able to, you know, bring that mean streak out. You know, he needed a knockout. Kind of remind me, reminded me of what Terrence Crawford did to Sean Porter. Right. But anyway, that was the first visual, if I'm not mistaken, the first of me really sitting in front of the TV, like, man, like, okay, man, they, you know, they going at it. And I'm, Sugar Ray Leonard, Sugar Ray Leonard, that mainstream, main name, that's that next superstar, I guess, after Muhammad Ali. So it was falling in love with the name and knowing who Sugar Ray Leonard was. And I just kept with it. My mom started the first boxing gym I ever went into and started training. My mom signed me up with Joe Frazier's boxing gym. Okay. I was about nine years old. We lived maybe three blocks from the gym, which was, you know, here in Philadelphia on Broad and Glenwood. We live right around the corner on 15th Street, like 15th and Clearfield. So my mom would take me around there and I would spar, you know, the kids. Well, you know, I had to train first, get myself to that yeah. level, then started with the sparring and stuff. But honestly, never, never stuck with it. Didn't have no amateur fights or anything like that. Just again, was just around the sport. Uh, every time I went over my uncle's house or whatever, the fighting was always on. So... It was just that natural uh, love, you know, just falling in love with with what I picked up on was just watching it from the IQ perspective, like distance and learning that stuff. And, oh, what is, what, you know, what does the jab affect? It? What is that for? And that type of thing. So boxing for me in my early 
age and early stages was an on and off thing. I was more involved in basketball. I loved basketball. Okay. Very talented, real good player. Played actually was at the number one high school at the time. I, I wound up going to Simon Gratz with Rasheed Wallace. Okay. I don't know heard of Rasheed Wallace, but we all played at Simon Gratz uh, for that basketball team back in the early 90s. But yeah, my journey, I guess you could kind of say I fell back in love. I always was in love with boxing, but kind of get got back into it um, around 19, 20 years old. Went back into Front Street Gym with a friend of mine who was a professional fighter. Uh, started training again, sparring with the pros. Demetrius Hopkins, who's Bernard Hopkins' nephew. Okay. Um, great amateur. Uh, went on to have a pretty good boxing career in the pros, but you know, kind of got sidetracked with the streets and stuff okay. for him. But um, yeah, I was always around these guys, but I kind of fell in love with the aspect of what the trainers were doing. Okay. Now, were you T around Nazim Richardson, Tiger, Rock Allen, uh, those guys? So, so those yes. guys were fighting in, they were younger than me, but I remember yes. them first coming up, up into the men's division and I mm -hmm. mean, these little jokers, they were fighting like 125, 132. So, th so you know, their yep. weight class is lower than me. So I really, mm -hmm. I was a welterweight. But you, the first time I seen them like at U.S. Nationals, I'm like, man, these little guys are special. You know, yeah. and Nazim, obviously people in Philly knew him and people on the national scene knew him, but he wasn't mm -hmm. like a legend like he is at this point, you know as far as what he did in the pros and with Bernard and, and many fighters. But you got to yeah. be around and exposed to. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, the, the Some of the trainers that came out of my gym, um, I can say were legendary. Again, to the boxing purists, I came up under, was actually trained by uh, Sonny McCord. A lot of people would know Wesley Mozan who went on a train. Um, that ain't, they don't call him Mo, did they? No, that's not Mo. I know you're talking about. You're talking about. He had um, Michael Brittingham back in my day. Yeah. yeah. He tra also trained um, Ray Robinson. Ray Robinson. And he had another kid, too, who was terrific. But the kid got shot. He got hurt. He's a trainer now. He's training. Um, uh, are you talking about Rasheem Jefferson? Rasheem Jefferson. He had him, Coach too. Coach Rowe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So his um, trainer, I Mo, was the guy I knew back when I was a kid, just because you see these guys at Nationals and and uh, me and uh, Mike Brittingham, one of his young fighters, we were the youngest two fighters. Um, I was a little bit younger than him, but in the Eastern Olympic trials in 92, he was, mm -hmm. uh, he was 17, I was 17, but I had just turned 17. And then we were talking one time. He said, man, I was the youngest one there. I said, man, when's your birthday? He told me, I said, no, nah, I got you. But I had so many months or weeks. Or, you know, but we we hung out down at the under nineteen national championship one year down in Gulfport, Mississippi, and um, you know, so it was just good experiences to meet those. You know, obviously, you know, traveling around, you meet. For me as a kid, it was cool because it got it got me to travel. Hey, this was how I was gonna get to go places. So that's why. I mean, yeah, me. The thing is now, of course, again with social media being able to provide visuals for everybody to see what coaches look like, what fighters look like. You can actually just go on a page and kind of see them. But like you tell the story of Coach Mo and um, people like that back then, we didn't really have that. It was like if their name wasn't making a newspaper or just word of mouth coming into the neighborhood, hearing about what they did if they went away to the Nationals. Because uh, Coach Rell, who's Rasheen Jefferson, yeah, he grew up right around the corner from me. I lived on the main, main street, Allegheny Avenue, and he grew up right here on Dover Street, the first little small block. I mean, I can take 60 steps and I'm at his house. So I watched him grow up from like the age of five, six years old. So when he got to the point of competing he was just that little bad kid in the neighborhood that sometime you know some of my older friends we would be out there on the courts on a little crate courts playing basketball a little rail to come by doing something crazy one of my friends would pop him in the head or send him back down the street crying but one thing about him and it remains to this day this guy is so competitive. Like I seen it in him as a kid. So for him to take on boxing 
and be as successful as he was before he actually was shot and, and he also was in a motorcycle accident that messed up his spine okay and you know that kind of just took him out in the yeah. with boxing but, but he yeah was, i mean he won the uh, national gloves a bunch of times in a row yes yes yeah. yep he was a he terrific fought. fighter yeah he fought against some of the best man yeah he stayed at the nationals like yeah constantly winning them yeah rasheen was and now his son is a pro like his son is really good i think uh rasheen jr is like four and oh three and oh four and oh he signed with top rank and he works with uh tevin farmer some too don't he mm-hmm yeah. yeah, at least they did. I don't know what's going on with him now. Tevin hasn't been as active lately, but that he was a part of that team. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a biggest part. If you ask me, he's the one in school. Tevin, I want. I, I would like to get to that or make mention of. Sometimes we may see people on the front line and think that they're the big fish of the crew. Yeah, but no, other people who really put in that groundwork and deserve a lot more credit you than Rel. Well, to me is one of those guys when you said that what i thought of as soon as you said that what jumped to my mind was remember lou duva and that whole stable of olympians coming out of 84 uh -huh. um, but the mastermind in that camp was georgie benton of that course. was that was the teacher in the group he was schooling Absolutely. them young fighters he's the Absolutely. one who was the truth in the whole camp Duva yep. was the face, the personality, and I'm not saying he knows or don't know boxing, but compared to Georgie Benton, I think, Absolutely. I think Georgie Benton was the mad scientist of that group. There you go. Yep. You know. Yep. Fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, so now, so as a, you really didn't, you never competed so much as a fighter, but as a trainer, you said you started to get interested in that in the early 20s. When did you actually start training guys? Because I know you've been at it for a minute now. And and was it first with your own son or was it with other fighters in the gym? Way before my son was even born um, with the other fighters in the gym. After I would spar with the pros, I mean, coaches started to ask me, like, how much boxing experience do you have? And I'm telling them, well, you know, I've been in gyms. I watched a lot of fights, but me particular, I have no real experience. And they like, dude, how did you just get in the ring and pull that off? I mean, you look real comfortable, natural. And I said, from the just watching. But I, you know what? I say God blesses certain people that way with coordination. True. Like nat coordinated. Yep. Um, being able to, you know, think quick. And, Plus, you're an athlete. And, I mean, uh, to be an yeah. elite level basketball player as a young age, obviously, you had a lot of athletic ability. So some of that probably crossed over. Yep, it had to. So, um, you know, just doing that and they kind of got me into, you know what? I The first thing I learned, how I really became one of the assistant coaches, a, a understudy of those great coaches was just holding the mitts. Used to always, you know, I fell in love with just watching mitt work. But back then yeah. it wasn't as choreographed yeah. and as we seeing everything today. They Bro. they stand <laughs> free on it. Hey. They got tied around a waist, and I mean, it's it's just ridiculous. It's, but back then, when yeah, coach yeah. trainers were real old in the midst for specific purposes. That's what I fell in love with. Like yeah. when when the pros was really popping the midst hard with vicious uppercuts and hooks, and it was just get what you need out of this. And let's move on to the next thing we need to do. Not like we just doing it for the next 30 minutes just to be doing it and it's some type of aerobic to teach stuff. Something. Yes. You know, yes. growing up, you know, my trainers were old men. My first trainer was an old Italian man. He died when I was eight years old. I started at five. But that's an old dude. He, wow. And he really didn't school me so much. But then a new uh -huh. trainer came in, an old black man named Bill Sangster. And uh -huh. he taught me to be a smart fighter. But these guys didn't hold mitts. And the guy who ran the gym after Bert died, my first trainer, um, old man named uh, Ray Herrera, these were older gentlemen. They were like getting up in age. So like they didn't hold mitts. But one thing we grew up on, we sparred every day in the gym. I mean, rounds. So you were always sharpening your craft. You know, it was a whole different type of generation than today like like you say um you know Bashir he said there's all kinds of trainers 
They look good on the mitts, he said, but can they coach and can they teach? You know, and when I see you, I respect your work because I see you teaching these young young men and really getting the technique right. And that's what I respect and what drew me to your uh, Instagram was like, man, this guy. And I pick up ideas. I'd say you can learn from anyone. You never that's done right. learning. When you stop learning, you fail as a trainer, as a fighter. You know, we got to keep learning and learning from each other. Yeah, that's just all that ego, man. And that's what I try to uh, stay away from and keep pushing that message. Because what you, when you're comfortable in your own skin, it's a good thing. But then you gotta you, you, you still have to kind of stand up for other people sometimes. Because what I see a lot of these real good coaches, mind you, or real good trainers, they I mean they they get heavy with they with the, with the word play on social media and they just act like they the only thing that's walking around the earth and they done trained every world champ and yeah. you can't tell them nothing and I think it discourages new trainers that want to come up and get in the game or even parents that's starting to you know with social training. media you got a home training with parents training their kids mm -hmm. and I watch a lot of it and I see I see where they mess up at I see where it's not as sharp but I'll DM them I won't put nothing on a comment but I'll go in a DM and just give them nothing but encouragement to keep going and, and they'll look back and be like oh i just got a dm from the mad scientist and i'm like wow i'm somebody out there yeah. so that type of stuff is what i want to keep pushing that message like listen don't be in comparison don't compare exactly. yourself to nobody exactly. do it at your own pace trust me like we all and you're right we all get to learn if i'm watching these home videos yeah. that mean i'm still trying to pick up something and i am like i'm always learning every I, day i saw um i saw a drill you did with the shield not too long ago and i'm like man i like that but see that goes uh -huh. in the backpack now now that's a drill i can use so i appreciate it and like you said i do see some people out there with huge followings and more uh -huh. so on probably on youtube a lot and there's a handful <laughs> But sometimes it's like they'll put out a video and I'm like, man, they're trying to slap shade at someone else who has a different yep. approach to teaching something. And yep. boxing is tick tock, man. We can go back and forth with styles, with strategy, with techniques. Just because someone teaches something doesn't mean it's an absolute truth. That's how they teach and that's what works for them. And as long as it's working for their fighters. But someone else might teach a different style, a different philosophy, a, you know, and that's their truth. And so no one's right or wrong. And I think yep. there's room, like you said, it's a small community. There's room for everybody. And even me, like I invite, I would love to have some of these other guys just because I love to talk boxing. I would mm -hmm. love to mm -hmm. get their viewpoint. You know, some of the big names out there, some of these guys, and I've commented on their stuff just to try and get them engaged. And every once yeah. in a while, get them to respond on something. But it's like you can kind of I don't want to say it's like I feel like you like there's no threat. There's no competition. We're not, when we are across the ring, obviously we're competing, but it's gentlemanly. It's it, it now. Now, yeah. after the fight, we're all friends. But could we learn from each other? Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt about yeah. it. How much easier it would be if we took that simple approach yeah but the egos you know how it is i mean it's the egos getting away everybody want to stand out for you know for whatever reason i want my place in the game too but i don't i don't have to it don't need to be get, over someone else's head stomping right someone had to get there exactly so it is what it is man i, I try to just push positive energy on social media mm -hmm. even though i took a lot of you know bricks and stones and and stuff indirectly directly and social media over the years that come floyd says it best it comes with the territory but for the most part 95 percent of the energy that i've dealt with has always been positive so I, I go with that right hey that's that's wonderful how did you get started with your son <coughs> um i've probably been following you guys with little futures channel originally and I seen this little man with his mohawk, and I'm like, man, he's nice, you know? And um, I saw him grow up. I mean, I know football is kind of his main thing at this point, it seems like, and I know he just recently got injured. But how did you get going, or what kind of, were you already training kids in the lab? 
or or how did you start with him no i would say that was kind of like uh once i fell back from training pros when i was at front street gym back in my early 20s again i started uh going to local shows you know we would travel to shows with professional fighters and again i was either the mitt man and until I worked my way up to actually being in the corner, being that that assistant, you know, the second assist to the chief mm -hmm. uh, trainer or whatever. So I kind of, I had my, I got to the point where I started training my own crews, where I was the head guy. And I had a very talented kid who was a four-time national champion named Luis Castro out of Philadelphia, a Spanish kid. And the thing with him, it was the same thing. It was one foot in the gym one foot in the street and this kid coach rell he knows he knows him i i this is when coach rell was still competing i think he was maybe what, 11 what and year? no because that name sound i think i was done i think i was probably coaching by them myself and training the kids in but was Lewis this in Castro the early 90s mid 90s i would say today he's about 36 37 years old okay he's about 10 younger than me i'm 47 I, so lou got a 36 37. i have a vague memory of a of a kid out of philly um this would have been around with tiger and rock allen were still fighting um, but i remember seeing him at ringside and it was a smaller kid i don't know if he was uh -huh. 112 or around there uh, that's that sounds about right he, he gotta be a little younger than rock and tiger and them yeah though. He was I, younger, I would think like maybe 15 yeah. 16 then he might have been 14 15 around then but i have a vague a memory but the kid was he was sharp making some noise i mean you see these guys i mean i came up mm -hmm. i fought in the same tournament with floyd mayweather i seen mayweather get beat at the 92 national wow. pal yeah look the uh, mexican kid from california beat him in the finals yeah, and uh, David Reed fought in that same tournament, um, huh. and uh, Dave Dave won it. He beat Mike Nunley in the finals. I actually ended up losing in the semifinals to Lachance Shepard. I got a bronze, and then um, Floyd he got a he got a uh, a silver medal. He got beat, but even in and De La Hoya too. I fought in the National Silver Gloves one year with De La Hoya. What I yeah, funny story is this this local coach, um, not local, local, but like 45 minutes away, you know, he fought him in, in the Silver Gloves. And the, and the, some guys one time came, man, did he really fight De La Hoya? I'm like, yeah, I was there, man. Yeah, he fought him. And they're like, well, how, how do you, you know, how do you do? I said, man, they went at it for about 15 seconds. <laughs> De La Hoya caught with that body shot. It was over, man. <laughs> Yeah, De La Hoya stopped him. But De La Hoya was running over kids. He won that and then went into the National Golden Gloves as a 16-year-old and won the National Golden Gloves down in Florida. He was just a special. But you see those guys coming up, you know. Yeah. And you, like, just know, man, he, there's certain ones just stand out. I mean, and you're amongst them. So you, mm -hmm. you don't think they're any better than you. Cause you're right in there if you're in the same weight class definitely but uh i actually met um i met roy jones there in the day room we were in arizona at the national silver gloves and he had just lost in the olympics and i was um well that summer and this was in like february after that i'm playing a uh -huh. video game i'm about 13 years old i get done playing this game and this guy's watching me play the game and I look at him, I'm like, man, you know who you look like? And he's like, who? I said, that one dude that got ripped off in the Olympics. He's like, yeah, that's me, I'm Roy Jones. I was like, cool. So we took a picture together. And then yeah. later that night, they introduced him in the ring. But I said, why are you here? And he said, oh, my dad has some kids in the tournament. You know, we brought him up from Florida. So he has some kids in, in his oh. camp. But cool dude, he was down to earth. We spoke for maybe five minutes just about boxing and took a picture together. Then my boy was like, hey, man, let me take a picture. And I had a little disposable camera. I was like, man, that's my last one. And it, it was my last picture. He takes off running up to the hotel room. By the time he comes back, Roy was gone, man. <laughs> but he did get his picture that night. So good memories, though. Good memories. Oh, wow. Hey, so let's um, get back into... Uh, 
just bringing up future and, and what how did all that get going so yeah i was going to say um you know i fell back once um lewis castro kind of um he wound up being four and oh in the professional ranks we had got the fastest knockout in, in Blue Horizon. I know you heard of the Yo, Blue yeah. Horizon. Again. That's the one you looking down on the ring, right? Yeah. Tuesday night Listen, fights they used to do. With all with all that history and all those great fighters, including Bernard Hopkins and uh uh what's his name? The Camden Buzz saw, uh uh the white Muhammad Kwawi, okay. all those great fighters in that arena. We had the quickest knockout in Blue Horizon history. My kids stopped the a Mexican guy in 21 seconds of the first round. Wow. With body. I mean, Lewis was special, man. Like, just had that swag. Was he that a swag. or right-handed, orthodox? Orthodox. Okay. Yeah, orthodox. So, um, once again, once he shut down after four pro fights and kind of lost focus and went back to the street somewhat, um, that kind of put a damper on my situation, and I kind of fell back from the pro boxing scene um future was just born around this time so i would say maybe two years by the time future was about two i still got boxing equipment gloves bags and stuff all around the apartment every now and then i would head down to the gym future would start putting the boxing gloves and just going in the bags opening the bag up putting a big glove on the wrong hand backwards and punching on the wall so i'm saying my wife like uh-oh, babe, I think you might got one. So I'm like, nah, like, and, you know, I'm still kind of like, I ain't trying to get back in the box. I like no coaching. But I mean, he, three years old, he he holding up his hands. If he see a fight on TV, he's trying to, to do the jab. He's coming over to me. And, I, and, and after a while, I'm like, I start putting my hands up. Okay. Throw the jab, man. throw the right hand, move your head, slip rolling you know he's doing yeah. it like a kid <laughs> but i mean day by day it started hey. to catch on i said you know what when you out there searching for something sometimes it's right in your face wow so that's that's what i recognized i said I, I can't be upset that this guy you know decided to stop boxing and i had other pros too you might have heard of Mighty Mike Garnachas. I was one of his assistant coaches. He fought Danny Swift Garcia when Danny was on the uprise before okay. he became mainstream Danny Garcia. But uh, I got Mighty Mike to, a, well, we got Mighty Mike to about seven and no. And then uh, I think he took on different management and they decided to go a different way with trainers. They left the Man, city. You know, that breaks my heart. When, they, when you yeah. get, cause it's like the trainers feed you. The trainers are loyal. But the trainer's not yep. on a piece of paper. And so yep. now, as soon as you get new management, oh, we got our own guy. We, we need to bring you out yep. here. And it's like, there's coaches, I'm not known. You know, I mean, you have a name of following on Instagram, but in the boxing national right. scene, I mean, we're not known. But you're right. raising yep. champions. I mean, true yep. boxing coaches, they know each other. But, but, and you know, just by having a conversation with, if someone knows boxing, but you know, what happens I don't like is to see someone, now they get there and they get this man and now it's like, oh, we need a name. We need Freddie Roach or we need, and I'm nothing against Freddie Roach. I think he's a terrific trainer. But I say, and and Coach Al, I just did one with Coach Al, Olympic, um, Olympic coach, Philly legend. He trained David Reed. He said yeah. his advice to young fighters was, hey man, keep that one that brought you up. You know, mm -hmm. and I think, mm -hmm. you know, you're just not on paper. You're not on the contract. It's not, you don't have any rights. And, and to get on that real quick before I continue with future, just to say real quick, I've experienced that more than one time where, again, I, I'm i in the gym training this kid every day, Louis Castro, getting him sharp. I mean, his father was paying me top dollar for that, for that day and age, like the mid, late 90s. His father was paying me great money. I mean, I was still young myself, but I'm in the gym every day and we doing, you know, getting the sparring. Again, I'm bringing Coach Rell in. Well, he wasn't the coach. He was still an active fighter at that time to come spar with Lewis. And, you know, I'm getting him the best sparring. And, I mean, he's sharp on top of his game. I think by the time he got to his third fight, out of nowhere, we're at the venue. We in the locker room getting prepared. I mean, we running through the mitt routine. Now we doing the angles we need to make and let's get this body work. 
somebody from like the commission it wasn't even it definitely wasn't from our team because we we didn't even have no management yet his dad was still kind of just subsidizing his career but somebody from the pa commission came in a locker room and said yeah you in a lot you in the right locker room and i'm looking at the face like i've seen this coach on tv a few times i can't recollect i think he trained a lot of spanish fighters and stuff but i seen an older coach i seen his face on tv plenty i think he's still active today doing cuts and stuff but i'm looking like i seen this coach before he said yeah this this is the kid that you'll be walking out with you'll 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 be his head like you'll be the head trainer in this corner when y'all so i'm in there like he's telling some other guy that he's gonna coach your kid and and listen i've got to remember i'm in my mid maybe the mid 20s so i didn't want to mess things up so i kind of didn't say anything i mean i felt it inside and even my fighter was looking like coach like what's up what they took he was I wanting said, to Lou. walk out that night with your he went out, he went out with us and cornered my fighter he was the head he took the lead he was so the chief second I, oh, I hell had to fall. no yes so I've been through that. I, I mean, boxing is, I guess it's just one of those things that from the top and that, again, that that discouraged me. So when Lou, I had a, a loyal fighter, I, I must admit that because they was talking about even taking him doing the same thing. Lou, you need a fighter. You need a coach with a name. You need to go out of here and go to this training camp. And he was like, coach, I ain't with none of that. He said, before I do all that, man, I, I'll just stop. He said, my father not even going to let me do that. We with you. We rocking with you. So he was loyal to the end. And you raised but, uh, the kid. You started him. He, he won four national championships. He won uh, one, one under me, three with a previous coach who passed away. That's how I was able to step in. Now, remind you, I had way, we had way more notable, more advanced coaches more experienced coaches in that gym but when his lead trainer passed away his dad said i think you should go with that young man right there it's something about that young man he knows his stuff y'all can grow together and that's how i was able to take on lou who again had already won three national championships and had everything but i was able to not maybe make his offense better but i was able to make him more defensive so now he already had a beautiful punching style but he was willing to kind of get hit he knew how to ride with the shots but he would take shots back because he just knew that his output was going to be better than what you brung to him but i started teaching him no let's not get hit let's make them earn everything right. don't give nothing so when i put that style in him i mean the fans fell in love with him at the blue horizon we fought once in atlantic city because now again he was only four no they was getting ready to start building him they gave him a cake on his birthday one day he fought on his birthday which was December the 7th. I can remember that. So they was getting ready to start building this kid. But again, I start seeing the dirty politics that can go on. This man was walked into our locker room right before we went out and told, this is the fighter you need the corner. So they knew that I had a special kid, but they didn't know me. And after the fact, I found out, I said, well, why did that happen? Oh, well, in case it was a tough decision, they would lean towards your fighter. So we had to put a face in your corner so the judges would respect. And I said, oh, that's how this works. Yeah. So they educated. Yeah. They did educate. Yeah. I mean, there's Thank a little up. bit of truth. There's some truth to yeah. that. There's some truth to what they're saying. But the mm -hmm. practice of it, I don't respect it myself. But I mm -hmm. get what they're saying. And even on a state level, if you got a coach who's a, you know, a national coach, and you're uh -huh. taking a state team, and now this kid's true trainer who raised him, taught him how to fight, is with them. A lot of times they'll want that, the state team will want the the named coach to be the head yeah. coach in the corner, even though the instructions might be coming from the kid's side of his ear. Uh -huh. I mean, so you get it, but it, I don't know. What are your thoughts about the that? I mean, it it is a strategy, but at the same time, it's like, Man, you, you're raising the kid. He listens and learns and trusts you more than anyone. Yeah, it, it, it has to be. It has to be tough. And I think, I think, of course, with anything like that, communication is the key. If they would have came to me respectfully, maybe they just saw a young black trainer. I could have been Spanish, black, white. I don't know. But maybe they just saw a young trainer 
and said, I, you know, he don't have a lot of pull. He don't have no reputation. Again, it's all about the fighter. This is the kid who's going to do something that we could see so far. So we need your face out in case this kid, because that's how we was building him. I mean, he was blowing people away. Like I just told you, his first pro debut was a 21 second knockout. And the Mexican kid, the Mexican guy came in chiseled. I mean, ripped, strong. But once Lou landed that body shot, got him to the ropes off the jabs and was able to place that body shot, he just put him down. Touch and his liver. The cr- he touched that liver. Yeah. Hey, I always say you make the liver quiver. It don't matter how many right. six pack, eight pack, because <laughs> there's nothing to protect you, it. They let bottom you elbow, get you get it there. Uh, uh, so, um, off of that, I'm kind of like, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of keep uh, veering off of future, but. Yeah, what you know, as we was getting to, you know, day by day, I just really started um, working with my son. And I think by the time Future was four or five years old is when I really start noticing like his IQ. I said, man, this kid, you know, he, he can really look like he can really be something. But, you know, you there's not, no lane for you at that age. The only lane that it, it was crazy the timing of it was social media i mean he wasn't even old enough to participate in amateur boxing right. yet i could take him in a gym at six years old and i was sparring him against seven year olds eight year olds and he was holding his own and he was always strong like future always had this build he was more muscular than i ever been so even at that age man i mean he had cuts and rips in his arms so i think People's, the phenomenon that people started catching on to was just the look. Like you said, you're talking about a, a, a young kid, muscular, with a mohawk. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Every gym we went into, he just captivated like people's attention. Then the way he could hit the mitts, that was kind of like our little side show. Let's do the mitt work. And that's when I was really caught up into that. Kind of like the Mayweather, Roger Mayweather style yeah. show, the mitt work and all that. So... That's when the name grew and people want to start taking pictures. It, it really built, man. Can can I take a picture of your son? Can I video your son? Can your son uh, spar my son or just help him out? And Instagram came out. Somebody actually told me because I was on Facebook a lot. And somebody said, yo, you heard about Instagram? So I'm like, no. They said, well, it's a, you know, a new app out. And I think your son would be great on there. So I jumped on there. I'm upside down. I'm, I'm, they teach. I'm following everybody. <clears throat> I'm following like 800, 1,000 people. And we only got like 52 followers that's following us back. And then people say, no, nah, the object is to get people to follow you. You following everybody. You, you don't have to follow all the people from around the corner. And it, I'm just pressing blue buttons. Just follow, follow, follow. So once I had to learn what hashtagging was, I mean, I was so far behind. Because I would like to think that if I really knew about branding and promoting and all this stuff that I was getting backlash and, you know, as we really start the following, start picking up, I'm like, Future probably would have had a million followers instead of having a hundred thousand plus that he got now. But I really had to learn. It took me about a year and a half, two years to even learn what a hashtag was. I didn't know none of this stuff. Right. But um. That was the, you know, the process, like kind of like the steps and getting him involved in boxing. He he kind of, you know, came on his own, like putting gloves and stuff on on his own. So it, it might have been great granddaddy in there, in him. You yeah. Know, who knows? I do, yep. I do think we're not too far from the other side. You yeah. Know? So that, yeah. who knows, could have, could have, he sent you a gift. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know? Definitely. And then that was always my back pocket. You know, pocket. just um, speaking of boxing, just because I love to learn and I love to share and you know mm-hmm. exchange information. So, so one of the things that you know it's hardly ever talked about. But where do you train fighters to look? And then I would like to share what I was taught, and then what I also now teach fighters. But where do you train fighters to look? A day one beginner. Or are you even acknowledging that or teaching that? Where do you look no, it, with your eyes? Your focus. Okay. Uh, well, I was always told um, my upbringing. I was always told. Now you're talking about if I'm looking at my opponent. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, you're in the <coughs> yeah, ring. You got an opponent in front of you. Where are you? Where are you looking? Okay. Chest, chest, shoulders. Um, <clears throat> I was, you know, I again, I was always taught never really pay attention to the eyes. You know, always kind of look because actually, anywhere around the torso. The, 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 I'm, I'm told I'm told to look, you know, telling my fighters, look at the elbows. And one of the things I hate is when my fighters constantly move their elbows like they nervous, you know, all that unnecessary movement. So I would tell my fighter kind of look in the chest area because that's when you'll notice all the flinches, the shoulders, the chest. And a lot of people, a lot of fighters, even pros, even great, even very good professional fighters today. The giveaway is they move their hand backwards before they go forward. So I'll telegraph. tell my fighter, yeah. telegraph, I always tell my fighters to try to concentrate on anything moving around the chest area because, you know, this this high guard stuff is kind of like done went out the window. It's like everything, everybody think they can box with the chin high, exposed, hands low. But I, I said, even if you fighting like this, I can't see my hands right now. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how long it's going to take my hands to go from point A to point B, or even if it's going to be an accurate shot. Because if I'm sitting back here like this, it might look flashy, but I have no vision of where my hands are. Right. So beginners, I'm teaching them that you're almost like the European style. Like, see, you'll hear me in a lot of my new videos saying, see your left hand. Always see your lead hand. If you southpaw, see your right hand. Mm -hmm. See that jab hand. That's This controls everything. This is this it's is so your part. Yeah, so, so I'm telling you that area. I coach. would love to share with you what I was taught originally. So my trainer originally, now now Sugar Ray Robinson was his favorite fighter. So obviously he was influenced by the late great. So he taught me how to use my legs. I was really, earlier in my career, was much more of a boxer as far as stylistically. Mm -hmm. Now he taught me, you always look you always look over your jab hand, right? But he always trained me, you look a man in his eyes, right? He said, okay. you look him in the eyes. And what I've taught fighters is by having a shift in my focal point from your chest area to your eyes, one, I have a higher focal point. So now, see my eyelids, they block stuff. But now if mm -hmm. I look up a little higher at your, now I'm not raising my chin, but just looking up higher at your eyes, I can catch everything else underneath with my peripheral vision. And so it's like if a, if you're reaching into the cabinet and salts drop and you reach out and catch it, you know, you you just, it just happens. You start right high above. But if I'm I'll... looking lower and the salt drops, well, I don't see it because my eyelids are blocking me. So if I'm mm -hmm. looking at your chest, to me, I want to get up and look in your eyes. One, because mm -hmm. I can see your soul. I can see, I can see everything. I can read your face, but that's mm -hmm. a psychological. And then also guys are intimidated by the stare down, right? Guys, you get uncomfortable when you're walking in a grocery store, you make eye contact with someone, but you don't just keep locked in on them because people get uncomfortable. Yeah. But if you're used to training in the gym and you looking at a dude's eyes, you just steadily, it's nothing to you. So when you go to fight, the stare down ain't nothing. You ain't gonna break because you're not uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You can stare at a man's mm -hmm. eyes. You stare at a man's eyes three round, three minute rounds every single day. So mm -hmm. that's what I train fighters is to look at the eyes and use your train your peripheral vision to catch everything else. Because even with good peripheral vision, I can see a low up jab coming. I could see your hands low. I could see your hands high. And better yet, the 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 shots that give guys trouble is that overhand right. If I'm looking at yeah. your chest, because I've seen kids getting clipped and I'm like, man, you didn't see the shot? And I'm like, where right. are you looking? And the kid's like, oh, I'm looking at his chest. I'm looking at his mm -hmm. elbow, his arm, his shoulders. You know, and mm -hmm. I've heard mm -hmm. a lot of different, and those were like pros, they're kids that I didn't raise, guys that I worked with that came to me. Obviously, I didn't teach, teach them from day one, but my day one beginning boxer, I personally teach look in the eyes and that's why is because I like to train your peripheral vision to get highly mm -hmm. developed to catch everything else. And just because your eyelids, they block some of them overhands coming in them looping shots with the higher focal point. Now I can see everything underneath. 
and I'm and I'm able. So that's kind of my, you know, my thing. I know I heard uh, Andre Ward's trainer one time. He said, someone asked him that, and he said, you know, I've never seen a man get hit with someone's eyes, meaning you should watch their hands, which I agree with that. But I can watch your hands, but I can look in your eyes and use my peripheral vision and I can still see your hands. And so that's right. that's my philosophy there. Um, definitely, my trainer said, you fight behind a faint and left jab. You know, he said, we fight behind a faint and left jab. And then we looking over that every time, like how you telling your guys to look, you know, and we could adjust the range that we want to box at. You know, mm-hmm. but looking over that jab hand, that's where it's at. And I see a lot of guys, and it, to me, I don't like the Philly shell for a beginning fighter. I teach basic. No. I want your hands high, protect yourself at all times, because to yep. me, there's a hole in your defense. All you need is a sharp fighter that knows how to faint. He's going to catch you with the faint. You're going to go to shoulder roll, and then he's going to clip you. And if you're fighting someone who's highly trained and skilled at the Philly shell, to me, that's a faint. Then I'm going to make body contact. So I'm going to faint you first. You're going to roll or move. Then I'm catching you in the chest, in the elbow, in the shoulder. I'm just hitting you with center mass somewhere to knock you off balance. Mm -hmm. Then I'm throwing my shots after that. I'm opening up. Um, I actually had the honor to share the ring with Corey Spinks on two occasions the first time was at the national pal in uh must have been 97 national pal championships <laughs> it was in st louis in his hometown he got the nod you know so the next year though he had turned pro and a lot of pros what? would come down to colorado springs to do their camp wow wow um, there was a pro gym down there called 3d dick woods <laughs> ran it and he would bring over pros or he would send over pros to come spar at the Army World Class Athlete Program on Fort Carson. And he came over. I had just got back. My dad had died. I had got married all in one month. And I come back with my new bride. And uh, there's more to the story I won't share on camera. But um, speaking of the new bride, anyway, you might be able to read through the lines. I went in there. Let's just say I was loose as a goose, all right? <laughs> I go in, coach called me up, he said, hey, you sparring Sphinx at 2 o'clock. I got you a rematch. I said, cool, I'm on my way, coach. So I, I go over to the gym, and he had been, I guess, getting the best of my my teammates, you know, that week. And this was mid middle of the week, and I come over. I just got back in town. I come over, you know, we spar. And he and he is southpaw and lightning quick. But that joker would he would he would make you come up short, and then he would light you up two three two three. You know, like he just had fast hands. And so what I was doing to him, I'm an orthodox fighter. I was fainting him. I was getting the bite on that faint, and he would go back. But when he rode back, before he could get his two off, I was drilling him to the to the chest and body area, drilling him to the body with that two. So I would faint the jab, he was bite bite on it. I was stepping in strong, a deep step, strong with that two to the body and coming back over top. Ooh, and I like to clean his clock with that hook to the head. And then I had him on the ropes and I got my, you know, my chance to flurry. But then we'd regroup and we start back at square one. But I swear I had his number that afternoon and I definitely got the best of that sparring session. And afterwards, his coach, um, out of St. Louis, uh, he used to be a police officer, real good coach. He trained Devin Alexander. Cunningham. Cunningham said, man, kid, he said, you've been around. And I said, yeah, you know, I said, and then Spinks goes, Evan Cunningham. from St. Louis from the PAL. So he remembered that we had fought. You know, Spinks remembered me better than his coach did. And so he's like, man, you've been around. But later that afternoon, I was at the mall and there was a pro mm. in that gym. And he said, uh, Tom, his name is Thomas Griffin. He was a heavyweight from Rockford. And he knew me from back home. And he said, man, he said all week, Spinks, Spinks was coming back from, from the Army you know, program, <clears throat> talking about getting on everybody. And he's like, and I was thinking, man, Steve over there too you know he knew me as Steve Uh and he's like you know that he would have thought I would have did better with him and then he and I said man I sparred him today I got at him 
And he goes, man, he goes, I knew you did. He said, because when he came back over, I asked him how sparring was. And he said, he just kind of held his head down. He's like, it was good, good work, you know. <laughs> but I promise you, I, that's my claim to fame. So he went on to become the undisputed welterweight champion of the world. I went on mm-hmm. to become a school teacher mm-hmm. and a coach, you know, a trainer. But, uh. Hey, it's that same thing. That's what I, I try to, the, that life part of boxing, what I school my, you know, uh, my understudies on is you don't know what propel people to be in a position. Everybody has to stand on somebody's shoulders or use them as, you know, a, a, some type of springboard to get to where they are. Mm-hmm. Floyd Mayweather wouldn't be great unless he had that guy that you said you what you witnessed him losing to in the amateur I'm, I'm sure that sat with him and he probably wondered what what adjustments could i make if i ever fought him again or if i fight somebody with a similar style so we all have somebody and nobody probably would never believe you i mean at the common person if you say if y'all watching a world championship fight and y'all watching Corey spinks if they don't know too much about your background and you say well i fought him before you know, several occasions I sparred them for them. They'd probably be looking at you like, oh, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Like, I got pictures of the you know? fight, though. I got a picture of the fight. And, and, oh, and then okay. I got, uh, so I did put out a YouTube video about being careful. I don't like guys to pull because that's a faint too mm-hmm. waiting to happen. I don't, I like to use pulling as an instinct. Be instinctive and be, you know, that's cool if you pull out of range, but you're still in the line yeah. of fire. You're still Uh in the line of fire. Uh So Uh I prefer you to slip, clean, block. That's full coverage insurance. Block, right? Or parry before you pull. So pull, Uh I want that as the instinct. It's still there. It's instinctive. Pull out of range. That's fine. But be careful. Be mindful because you're still in the line of fire. So if we faint and step strong with the two hand, we're going to touch you. So facts, you know, what yep. I mean, so there's now, there's all kinds of strategies, but but I don't like a Philly shell for a beginning fighter just because, look, man, you you just ain't ready for that yet. You need to learn basic because you don't have nothing to refer back to once you get in trouble and it ain't working for you. You got uh-huh. basic, you know, I teach what I call a hex boxing stance, hands high under the eyes, right? Elbows in chin down, knees bent, and I shift my weight on the balls of my feet. And of course, we're in a traditional boxing stance. That's if I'm Mm -hmm. pressing a guy or if I'm fighting mid-range or if I'm, you know, putting pressure and moving forward. If I'm moving out, if I'm boxing on the outside of the pocket, now I can keep my hands out farther. I can look over that jab hand, you know, and I'm fighting more of a classical style boxing, pure boxing as a style that's another thing i teach is the spectrum of styles you know boxer on one end puncher on the end end. we got counter punchers we got in the middle that we got um you know an aggressive counter puncher a pressure fighter on that spectrum on the other side and i got a whole picture of this the other side you got an elusive elusive counter puncher that's a philly shell to me an elusive because in texas in chicago in michigan they don't call it a Philly shell, but it's a very similar style, you know? So it's, I know Georgie Benton's the godfather of it. And I, I read yeah. a book where he learned from some other guy. He saw some other guy fight who could not be hit. He said, you couldn't hit the dude with a handful of rice. He said, you throw a handful of rice, you couldn't hit him. He said, but the guy had no pop. He, could, he had no power. But he said, that's where he what? learned how to fight like that. So... Well, there you go. Somebody always going to get credit for Allen Iverson to change the subject. Allen Iverson said he learned that famous crossover from a guy that sat on a bench, a walk on at Georgetown University when he was in college. But he made the move famous, of course, when he went to the NBA. But it wasn't originally his move. He said this guy was just a walk on. He only got to play during practice time but he would always hit Iverson and them with that move and they'd be like damn like this guy keep blowing by or 
I go to the right, he go to the left off this crossover. And Iverson after practice say, yo, you got to teach me that move. And now look who gets all the credit right. for the crossover. Right. Hey, where this probably works for Coca-Cola. <laughs> right. Uh, Drives uh, his truck. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, that's just the way. I, you know, I man. always told, I always said my trainer, the old, the old black man, Bill Sangster. I would always say, man, he's the, he's the, the best, the smartest, unknown trainer out there. He was like an old Eddie uh -huh. Futch, you know, just, just an old wise man. You know, the first thing he taught me, he said, look, I'm gonna teach you how to outwit your opponent. And I didn't even know what that meant. I'm like, what? I'm eight years old. He said, outwit. Outwit means to outthink, outsmart. He said, we're going to fight smart. And so he taught me how to really fight smart and to think, period. And if we think, now we can figure things out and we're going to keep learning. You know, so I, I just love, I love talking to you, man. I love exchanging information with you. But um, it sounds like you hey, don't yeah. start with the Philly shell up to top either with beginners. No, I mean, you're right. You can't. That's do you going into advanced practices. Right. If you don't know what to do, that hand goes down. Yeah, you're going to get in trouble more often than not because, I mean, we all know everything starts with your foundation. Like what type footwork. of, you know, your footwork yeah. Yeah. and all types. So that's the obviously the hardest thing to teach, like proper movements, left side stepping, back pivoting and all that stuff. Yeah. So. If you don't know how to do that, then fighting with your, your lead hand down is you're just on. I mean, yeah, yeah you're in trouble because that's the that's your first instinct. Everything that come at you in a straight line, you're going to pull away from yeah. it. So, yeah, that's why I'm telling them to try to see your left hand. Take control. With, that's your navigation system. The, the block, the parry, the, the use, the, the crossbar, the, 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 the twist, then whatever you got to do to just touch. Now, one of my favorite shots, and I don't want to say, of course, I didn't invent the shot. So I can't, if I if I saw anybody do it, I saw Mayweather do it when he was uh, more so like Pretty Boy Floyd, when he was really quick in his younger years. And that, that was, he will wait for you to shoot your right hand and just touch it. Oh, and come and right come over. Right, yeah. Just so counter right I over refer to that as a cross parry. So I'm crossing... Mm -hmm. So as it comes, pop, pop. So we touch. Right. So if pop, I'm pop. right, if I'm yeah. shooting it at, touch it. And that's what I'm teaching them. See, a lot of, again, they, they I, I get it where they at in their levels. They want to force it all the way mm -hmm. down. I'm like, by the time you do all that, you don't have the speed. You don't have the pop. You don't have well, the, the, guy's the gone. short. He's gone. It, yeah. That, that move, that opportunity is gone. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm trying to really teach them. The, all you got to do is even if it just go down that far, that's it. You just want to move it up and just touch it just enough where you're going over the top of it. And I'm, try, I'm trying to turn a guy pro next year, but the only thing he's missing is hours. He's not putting in enough hours. It's always an excuse. And I am and I just asked him maybe about three weeks ago, like, she, um, I'm going to put his name out there because he knows, like, I get on him. Like, she, how bad do you really want this? Because y'all remember, y'all called me. I was training my son, minding my business. I was out of the pro game. I was pretty much done with it. Never been too much of an amateur guy. You know, I've worked with a few amateurs, but I was done. Y'all started reaching out. Maybe it was over the little future hype. I don't know. But y'all, hey, coach, I want you to train me. I want to be a pro and blah, blah, blah. I said, that's easier said than done. But when I asked y'all to show up, you can't keep telling me, Oh, I gotta go to the laundromat. Oh, the the, the, the uh, I gotta go at one o'clock and get my clothes out the cleaners. Oh, my aunt just something just happened with my cousin. I'm like, it's always something. I said, do y'all know that's a part of the game? Bernard Hopkins just sat in my house on that video you saw. Mm -hmm. He's actually came back over here a few times just to bust it up with me. But that particular day, we talked about four hours, and the things I learned from this man, even though we do talk kind of on the regular at least twice a month that particular day i mean he let it all go he opened up his soul and i'm like dude why are you doing that with me and he said i just know you're gonna be the next one he said because you got everything you're patient 
You got so much damn respect for the game. You always giving people that they props that probably really don't deserve it any more than you do. He said so, and, and you're very, you, you, you asked a lot of questions. He said, you, you listen more than you speak. So for me to be able to sit here and you just listen to me, he said, I, I need you to take the game to another level. So that's one thing he told me, and I learned this a long time ago. I mean, this applies to me and you. We can die as trainers mm -hmm. and coaches. Like you said, a fighter's fighting span is what, 10, 15, 20 years if you get to that level. Right. But for the most part, they're only going to have a five, six, seven year run. And then they got to go find a job. Because I mean, only 15%, 10 to 15% is going to make it to that upper it's echelon probably level. Less, so, really, you think about it. <laughs> probably. Yeah, yeah, true. So for me and you, we gonna be teaching and coaching and training to the day we die. That's what we choose right. to do, it's just in us. You know what I mean? We could be in a grocery store and see a little kid shadow boxing, have no idea what the hell he's doing. And we could take a moment to say, hey kid, lift your left hand up or tilt your head down or get get your head off the line. And they'll really sit there like, oh, okay. Like, the light bulb so goes on, yeah. Yeah, that's what we do, so. The things he it, the things he shared with me, man, is just like, man. So you know, that whole thing of um, like I said, I'm trying to see what I really got because that's where I want to be back. I want to be back in a pro game, but I do want to continue to work with the grassroots to get kids started, teach them certain fundamentals, uh, and that's it, man. I want to get in where I fit in, coach. That's about you know, it. The the grassroots to take someone from day one all the way. You know, I mean, it's it's almost rare now to see that. Mm -hmm. But to me, the fundamentals are where it's at. And I like to to teach some basics that don't require you to be special in any way. Obviously, if you're special, we can do more. Obviously, your son was very special. We can do special things with him now. We can teach yeah. him a Philly shell at a young age because of his IQ, because of his quick reflexes, because of his specialness. But now nine mm -hmm. other kids in the gym his age, I recommend don't teach them that because you're gonna get them hurt. Cause they, they don't, yep. they need to know fundamental basics of protecting themselves at all time, you know? And so in that sense, I lean on the boxing end of it as a style using my legs okay I'm, I'm more of a classical you know sugar ray robinson you know we're out on the end fighting behind a faint and left jab now when i'm mid-range or i'm pressing a guy now it's more is it's a modified version of a peekaboo and i'm slipping on both sides i'm staying off the line i'm bobbing and weaving i'm never a sitting duck i i hate when i see kids do this but i think what happens is a lot of kids today they see these pros come and sit in the pocket. They're going 12 rounds, mm -hmm. but they never learn how to use their legs. They never learn how to box. And so once at one time they get rocked, they don't know what to do. And it's like, look, man, you're a young beginner. Let's start by number one, I think as a style, let's teach you how to box. Let's teach you how to use the bike. Let's teach you how to punch and move, stick and move, hit and don't get hit. And let's start mm -hmm. just with your jab and get your jab so technically sound it can't be countered. And then let's add the two. Because I think so often these kids, they start throwing all these punches and combinations and it's like, man, you're developing really bad habits. Every time you throw nope. your one, your two's pulling back. Okay, uh. we need to clean that up. Let's get this, let's throw the one and keep it here. But now when I ask you for a two, then you start loading up and pulling and reaching and you're losing power, you're losing leverage. But let's get this right. Let's get this right. Okay, now we're ready to add the three. But it's a step-by-step -step approach. I um, mean, that's something mm -hmm. I've been building on my own. You know, I got this, it's a training platform that I use with fighters. And so right now I've got some in different spots. Um, there was a kid out in the camp with uh, Terrence Crawford, not like he was in training camp with them, but in the same gym out in Colorado mm -hmm. Springs I'm working with. He's he's a special kid. He's got a lot of ability, but 
you know, the IQ we need to bring up, the defense we need to bring up. I mean, the kid tried to fight out of a, uh, and I call him a kid. He's he's a grown man. I mean, he's a journeyman. Yeah, electrician. I get it. But um, mm-hmm. like he's getting hit with stuff he don't need to get hit with, and he's too tough for his own good. And we need to sharpen up his defense. And so I got mm-hmm. him on these online things, and it's the closest thing I can get to uh, to this kid without being in the actual gym with him. Obviously, there mm-hmm. that's second to none being in the gym with someone, but getting on a Zoom call like this, and I can show him, look, you're doing this every time you throw your jab. Or doing this, you staying right in range, and you and you ain't moving off the line, and that's why you're getting caught. You know, he can send me a clip of him sparring or something, and I'm able to educate in that in that respect. Yeah. And I love this. This is fun to me. Um, I'm not in the regular gym anymore just because once COVID hit, you know, and I had a stable of pros and I had a couple of elite amateurs then. Um, mm-hmm. But once COVID hit, I kind of pulled back. I just can't take those risks of COVID and being out there like that. So that's why for me, I just started moving everything online and started, you know, just doing this online YouTube and trying to share my my love and knowledge and you know, and like I said, I'm still a student of it. I never will stop learning. So that's why I respect you and, and invited you to come on. And I'd love to have you on again, man. We could talk about specific fights or anything, man. I think just chopping it up. Oh, so I, but we was just getting into it, man. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Um, and likewise. likewise I, I, I look man. forward to learning some more things from you. Um, I, I, I see the IQ. And, and also us at some point, you know, coming together, like bringing oh, everything. Collaborating, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, because when it comes to that particular style, the Philly shell and, you know, now that, that I would say you got the expertise. I fought guys with that fought out of that, and I know what to do against them. Uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. um, we when you fight a slick dude like that, you never go after his head. You don't go, you don't lead to the head. You'll never touch him. You got to lead with the feint, get him to bite. You got to make contact center mass somewhere. You got to knock him off balance a little bit somewhere. Hit his chest, hit his shoulder, hit his elbow. You know, and these guys, when they start turning like that, I know it's illegal, coach, but if I'm in the other corner and you got a guy turning like that, we eating up that kidney on your left side. <laughs> we gonna eat that one up. Oh, around that elbow, huh? Uh, I'm saying when you turn, when they turning away <laughs> and they giving yeah. me that back. So what I train fighters to do, I, and it's dirty, it's illegal, right? We hitting it in the kidney. I say, man, you rip that right to the kidney and but you got to camouflage it you just do that one single shot especially in the amateurs kids gonna roll around on the ground and you're gonna get disqualified but if you rip that shot and you come back up the middle and let your hands go whoo, now we just camouflaged it he didn't have a chance to cry and complain and whine and say hey man he hit me hit me in right. the kid you know what i mean but right. it's fighting we're fighting so there's there's rules but mm-hmm. rules of engagement, but at the same time, even internationally, I think Team USA tries to fight too clean and they get over there and get roughed up by these European styles and, you know, the Cubans and, you know, it's a little, it's a little rough. It gets rough, you know, so yeah. I think we, we need to uh, just toughen our kids up here in the States. You know? Hey, I want to... Hey, I want to say, um, I want to elaborate uh, a little bit because this is something that's been, you know, working my mind, man. It's, it's on my mind every day. But um, what my as far as my son, I just want people to know since I'm using this platform, a lot of people has been asking, what is he doing? Is he ever going to come back to boxing? I think for any parent, because that's been like a fine line thing of, I think I, I heard one time the WBC was talking about trying to ban fathers from being in the corners with their kids. Yeah, they just think it's too much. We just saw it with T.O. Like, uh, T.O. father wasn't really even giving him any more instructions. It was more so like, go knock that m and out, step to him. And it's like, dude, you're not telling me. That's, no, that's not making adjustments. No. How do you make the proper adjustments 
to win the fight, but they think he just turned emotional and made it personal. Same thing with Sean Porter and, and Kenny Porter. With mm -hmm. you know, they felt like he threw his son under the bus after the fight by saying he wasn't prepared and he didn't listen to whatever the case. But I just want to say that whole thing. I gotta be a father first. You know, I would I would just tell most most people, don't blow your relationship with your son or with your kids trying to, you know, stand in that coaching mode of, you know, the, the f coaching and fighter. It's, it's father, son first, at, at least in my household. It, it would always mm -hmm. be that way. I would never blow my relationship or jeopardize my me and my son's relationship worrying about a uh, coach, fighter, coach relationship or coach, fighter. Um, it's his life little future or big future now got to do what he needs to do for him it does sadden me sometime to see that like with the broken knuckle the doctors called it a, a boxer's injury mm. and the first thing i'm saying me and my wife both in the hospital laughing because she like babe i know how that makes you feel i said well yeah but once again this is this is his you know this is his calling this is what he want to do but those type of little injuries, because I, I I feel like Future is definitely world championship level quality. Like if he puts the hours and makes the dedication to his craft, I don't see too many kids on his level at all. It's just up to him to want to commit and dedicate himself to it. But um, those little injuries, sometimes they heal. He, he's young, sometimes they heal. Sometimes they, they, they re-break over and over. It depends. Maybe if he do start punching a couple jokers upside the head and sparring or whatever, he can re-break it. So that's the, you know, it's, it's the gift and the curse of those type of situations happen. But for me, I want to see him come back. I still do to this day. I think he got, I think not, not only just for the boxing piece of it, coach, for the boxing side of it, I think he's the right type of kid. If he wasn't Character. my son journey yes. future is so humble people don't see the things that he does off camera off social media he's always giving something away I, I tell him all the time this company wants to send you this they still want to sponsor you no matter what he say dad i don't want it send it to such and such dad didn't you say somebody dm'd you the other day and said they needed boxing shoes or some gloves or where to get the best gloves from send them my gloves dad it's, it's, it's all i'm like future you just got these gloves or you just got this outfit i don't care dad send it to them he hates bullying he's tried to fight other people battles in school and we in a city with over 500 murders mm. so i'm telling him listen you already have a name out here so it's a gift and a curse with that some people will come to your you. yeah. knowing who you are but then other people will try you feeling like they can build the reputation right. off of your name so you gotta watch what battles you fight you can't fight other people battle son but he really hates or you know just he, i mean to a t he don't like to see because he goes to a high school with all races chinese spanish black white he goes to roman catholic high school so you know he's seeing you know with this whole uh um um i don't know if it's the chinese or it's, it's like some type of racial thing going on where a lot of people is picking on like Asians, the Asian okay. community. So he goes to school with them. So he just do doesn't like it. And I'm like, dude, I, I get it, son. I love you for that. Like, I'm, I respect the way you feel, but you just can't fight everybody battle. So again, he's striving. He's doing pretty good playing football, trying to get into college. And he said, dad, after, after I get to see what type of colleges offer me scholarships, if it's not the type of school I want to go to, then I'll make a full transition two feet in. Because I told him, you can't come back to boxing if it's not two feet in. If you got one foot in and one foot trying to do something else, yeah. it's a wrap. Not this type of sport. So I think within the next two to three years, well, the next two years or so, we'll know that. He'll be a senior next year in high school. And again, once he sees all his offers and see if that's where you want to play football, if he don't like it. He said it's back to boxing because I think he's good for the sport. He'll be like another Andre Ward yeah. where he'll probably go into the sport, you know, hopefully win multiple titles, but more more than anything, set up programs to give back to, you know, maybe build a community center here and there in his name or just with his money if, if it comes to that and give back and just move on with his life. Because you, 
coach, you opened up with the perfect thing. They'll spend more time out of the sport than they will in the sport. It's only going to be a 10 year run, 12 years, if that. And then at the 38, 40, then you still got to live the rest of your life, you know? Yeah. So, you know, and, I think and with, Oh, I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead, coach. No, I, no I'm, I'm good, coach. You, you know, the, the other thing with that, that I think just lacks in most households and definitely in, in more inner city communities is a lack of financial intelligence. It's inner city. These are inner city kids. It's an alternative behavior high school. And these kids come out with a whole different type of financial IQ. They understand the simple thing of the difference between an asset, something that puts money in your pocket, and a liability, something that takes money out of your pocket. And if our young athletes, our young superstars, you know, coming from inner city communities, if they could learn just that one thing, invest your money in assets, things they're going to, you know, and I know Floyd Mayweather's big on that, but invest if you only have a short career. Take a good portion of that, a percentage, and stick to it and just keep investing in life after boxing, uh -huh. that fund that's going to be there for your family so you can walk away from this very dangerous sport with something for your family, for your future family. You know, so I think that's... um. I think that's needed in our circle of boxing community is definitely teaching, you know, young that's people. And even like I said, in some of my online training programs and whatnot, that's those are some of the things I include in there and teach um, in the Warriors way in my program is uh, got to get that IQ right. Get your financial IQ right. Well, I would definitely need you to do a course uh, yeah. Or, you know, do something with the lab, man. Anybody that I bring into the lab that we can I would do have it. a sit Absolutely. down, whether it's here, virtual it would be an honor. Home thing. And you can, you know, shoot that same knowledge to them, man, because, yeah, you much needed. Definitely much. To do it and just to serve and to help, you know, so we could definitely set okay. that up um it could be just like this you could just have your camera mm -hmm. and uh and the um you know the zoom i know you i know you got them on the sweet science side of stuff over there yeah for the most you part know? but hey we need um, you that too i yeah. mean that's just me i've always been open that's how i got yeah. or you know yeah. whatever that means but that's how i got to this level now by again listening you got to listen more than you speak like i I've all, I went in from day one, went in the boxing gyms, observing, looking, listening, you know, what's going on. I'm not going in there telling people what to do or thinking I know anything. I always went in with that keen ear and that keen eye to just watch, observe, and most importantly, listen, you know, to, and again, like you said, old school trainers, my trainers, Wesley Mozan, Sonny McCord, back then in the mid nineties, they was in a late 60s early 70s uh west he's already mm -hmm. passed away and you know who is another one of his understudies who's had a lot of success in boxing who came out of the same gym that i did so i would call myself kind of like an understudy of him too and that's billy bristow he's worked with Gab Gab okay. gabriel rosado and you know that. so billy's okay. been around the block he's been you know he's traveled the world and He's done everything from the technical stuff to the cuts to, you know, I mean, he's still doing it to this day, man. I'm watching that beard get grayer and grayer. It's like he, he's becoming, <laughs> I even got a little gray in my, in my beard, but it's like we're trying to step into that that next, you know, class and, and, and take over, like out with the old, in with the new. We're trying to keep that legacy going. But Billy Briscoe. I remember him being, you know, a little older than me. He's, he's probably got me by like five, six years. But How old are you, coach? Okay, so you're a year older. Yeah. I'm 46. Yeah. You know, the one thing I like, though, about you, and, and I would include myself in this as, as well, but we're teaching, we're bringing, yeah, we're, we're using new, newer training, conditioning, all the newer, mm -hmm. you know, things, plyometrics, those type of things, but also still bringing that old school knowledge to the next generation of fighters oh. 
learning how to fight behind a faint and left jab, learning about range and understanding range and, and why you get caught or when you get caught or, you know, really teaching to be a smart fighter, staying off the line. Yep. <laughs> you know, these guys, they coming in straight hey, like oh, that. I'm I just like, man, I don't know. Head. Did you follow my page, The Lab215 on Instagram? I'm I'm on the I the follow the these the mad scientists. I have a, you got a another second one? page called the Lab Two One Five. I maybe created it about eight eight nine months ago. I'm assuming um it's building up somewhat. I use it as like my backup page. But uh, I just posted a video. I just took my little team out last night to spar, and my kid, he's 13 years old. He pretty much, you know, I, I just started working with him, just started training him. He's been to, you know, quite a few trainers or whatever. But now his dad is bringing him to me. Last night, he, as soon as the bell rung, he wanted to get right to it. He was boxing. He was using his jab. Soon as the other kid, who was more so a little intimidated, start to swing and, you know, open up, my kid did the same thing. He just lost all focus mm. and just, and I said, yo, yo, stop, stop. Yeah. I said, L, L. Keep the range, keep the distance. We're not here for that. And I actually called the timeout, which a lot of coaches don't do no more. When they see stuff that they don't mm -hmm. like, you got to really stop that. You got to break that whole, I don't care if your kid is, is getting over. If it's not what you want, you have to show your kid how to do it. Right? You got to stop moment. the sparring. I'm seeing too much full sparring for the whole two, three minute rounds. It's a bunch of wild stuff. It's a bunch of once they get out of the clinch or the or the or the, or the little mix up, they walking away hands down along the body. Mm. Just the posture mm. is just bad. And it's like, yo, you gotta wake that fighter up and tell him like, yo, come here for a minute. I don't care about how many seconds we losing in this particular round. You need to know, man. Your posture gotta look good. The, the look up. If you look like you know how to fight. That's a fit. <laughs> They're gonna jump. Yeah, I mean, on. you know what I mean. Yeah. So yeah, like you said, it's all psychological. It starts with the IQ, okay. and uh, all this stuff starts up here. And that's that's the biggest thing I be want. I don't want people to think I'm the most technical. I'm the best in the game. It's not about that. I'm just trying to go with the natural IQ, common sense of, of the sport. That I'm trying to carry. Hit and don't get hit. Yeah, and and even what you mentioned. I mean, if you do yes. Yeah. Okay, get behind that faint and left jab. He don't need to know your gas. And and put your hands up and suck some air in. You can't see it, but right here, I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. sucking it up because I'm out of air. Mm -hmm. Okay, and faint. Get, keep the guy biting on that faint. Keep him on a defensive mindset so that you can recover from hey, the exchange. Let me ask you a out. question, and I'm sure what you're going to yeah. say, but I just want to throw it out there too, a question to you. Where if a fighter, if it's two people fighting or whatever, and uh, again with this, where where would you say the safe zone is? Like if it's, you know, even if it's just sparring, it's not even necessarily a fight. Where's the safe zone for, let's say you, or if it was your, your fighter against his Okay. So this right here, this is the mm -hmm. line of fire. I do not want, that is not safe. That's like down Main Street. I want to be off and under Main Street. I want to be off and under mm -hmm. the line. And a lot of times, and a lot of guys will say, and of course you shift weight. You do shift weight. Left foot, right foot, lead foot, rear foot. Okay. But I want to be, a lot of time I train guys, sit on that back leg, sit in the pocket. Okay. If I'm fighting mid range. Why? Because I'm loaded for a jab and I'm loaded for a deadly too. My right is loaded. You know what I mean? So I want to be, if this is the line of fire, I want to be off the line and slightly under the line. That's safer to me. And the safest thing is be, is behind a faint and a left jab because now I got you defensive mindset. I got you biting. It's like double dutch. We're playing double dutch you know with the jump ropes and you got the one on the side and they're waiting trying to time it yeah. when to jump in that's how i want you to experience when you fight me i mean obviously i'm not fighting anymore 
But if, but if one of my fighters or someone I'm teaching or working with, I want them to get get you biting to where your mental energy. It's like you you like that double dutch guy. You don't know when to attack. You don't because you're always dealing with my jab, my double jab, my feint, and I'm turning you. I'm not staying in front of you. Never am I staying in front of you. This is the dumbest. This is this is what I call dumb boxing right here, coach. That's my head. Here I come. Okay, tee off on me. Knock me out, because that's what I'm asking for. <laughs> now, this guy, he never on the line. Angel. Changing levels. He fighting yep. behind a jab. He changing up speeds. He jabbing fast. He double jabbing real quick. Then he's slowing it down. He might he might walk you into a right hand. He might he might jab your stomach, faint to the body, catch you with the two to the head. I mean, there's all kinds of different strategies. That's the yeah. stuff I love. I love the strategy. I love to look. I could look at a guy for 30 seconds and immediately I'll look and see holes in his defense. And then I say, okay, well, this is where we can do this. This is where we can do that. But so that's my answer. It's definitely not here. I want to be off the line and out of the line. So what what were you thinking I was going to say? Or no, what you no, had to no, no, no. Share with that's, me that's, on that? that's what I wanted to get out of. I wanted to go with that. Um, Again, it's, it's, it's something I need to take back. You know, I'm always looking to take something back to my guys, my team, the older ones down to the smaller ones or whatever. So I just wanted to get your perspective on that or whatever. Yeah, I think I think it's um, I mean, obviously everything, you know, the great Bernard Hopkins, he knows that that's how he fought. He was never on the line. I mean, rarely. And, and he's, you know, if he's crossing the line, it's because he's, you know, he's just giving you a different look, but he ain't going to stay on Fetch. the line because that's the most dangerous spot in the ring. Man. You know, but even by being a step off the line, I'm already in better position. I'm already, it I already got an advantage over this guy. Yeah. This guy, that's a, we call him a sitting duck. My trainer used to say, never be a sitting duck. He said, something's moving. Either your hands are moving because you're punching, your head's moving if you're sitting in the pocket, or your feet are moving, which is even better defense if I'm turning you. You know, this dude taught me some old slick stuff, man. This He had me come out, throw a combination, and, and grab a dude right behind his shoulder and turn him. Boom, boom, boom. Now I'm tripling up the hook. Yeah, you know I mean, he just was an old crafty dude, man. No one will ever know his name. Bill Sangster's his name, but he, the dude just knew. Coach, boxing. I got a 14 year old. His name is Mujahid Green. When I tell you, you're going you're going to hear a lot about this kid. I'm, I pray for him. He got a great mom. You know, I, I, I never met his dad or anything like that. His mom reached out to me. Same thing. She didn't know any better. She was just taking him to different coaches around the city and they letting them get away with bad habits. And I mean, the talent is there and more than the talent, 